أسعد الله أوقاتكم بكل خير وأهلا ومرحبا بعودتكم مجددا أيها السيدات والسادة. Well, welcome back everyone and bon appetit. Hopefully you enjoyed the lovely buffet over there. The date pudding I hear was the finest. So if you had some date pudding, congratulations. Achievements are unlocked by 100% in this summit. والآن حان وقت الاستمتاع بجرعة أو خلينا نقول وجبة معرفية من خلال جلسة جديدة بعنوان التحول من استهلاك المعرفة إلى إنتاجها. طبعا يتحدث في هذه الجلسة الشيخة نورة النعيمي مدير مركز عجمان المدير التنفيذي لمشروع سلسلة مستقبل عجمان وكريم الصباغ المدير التنفيذي لشركة دارك ماتر وأندريك أونيك المتحدث الرسمي لمبادرة إستونيا الرقمية هذا الحوار بإدارة الإعلامية الزميلة هند مصطفى معلم من MBC. Ladies and gentlemen, there are two kinds of people in this world. There are takers and there are givers. And this session is about giving. A session that focuses on the importance of moving from consuming knowledge to producing it. We welcome on the stage Sheikh Anur Al Naimi, the director of the Ajman X, and will be joined by Dr. Karim Sabah, CEO of Dark Matter Group, and Indrik Unik, speaker and exposition engagement at E Estonia, moderated by and tackling subjects like the future jobs in the knowledge society, moderated by Hind Mustafa Muallim, journalist at NBC. Your collective applause is appreciated. So, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the loyal ones who stuck around with us today after lunch. Uh, I hope we will make your time worthwhile. In a knowledge-based economy, the road towards the future is paved with artificial intelligence. In this era, citizenship crosses country borders and individuals become truly international. The fourth industrial revolution is blurring the lines between the physical, digital, and biological spheres. With that, old economic pillars become obsolete, and amongst all that melts, knowledge rises, becoming the kernel of value required for societies to advance and move towards prosperity. Survival of the fittest, or maybe survival of the most hybrid, in this case. So having emphasized how important knowledge is or the value of knowledge, how can we shift from purely consuming it to eventually producing it? Along with my esteemed panelists today, we hope to drive this conversation forward and discover uh, where to explore in our search for answers. I would like to first introduce uh, Sheikha Noura Naimi, director of Ajman X, uh, she is representing a very interesting local example uh, with regards to shifting towards AI we will, with, uh, in government services. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Dr. Karim Sabag, CEO of Dark, Dark Matter, hope, hopefully keeping us safe amongst all this. And Mr. Endrek Onik, the speaker and exposition engagement at E-Estonia, uh, which is, uh, according to Wired magazine, you said was the most, uh, the most digital society in the world. We'll talk about it a little bit as well. I would like to start off with uh, a very basic uh, question. Let's define what a digital citizen is. Um, back in the day, it used to be as simple as someone who has a digital presence somewhere, but I think we've moved a very, very long way uh, from that. Uh, Dr. Karim, would you like to maybe, from your understanding of how individuals are dealing with technology today, start with this definition? Yeah, well, I will start where you sort of handed over a digital citizen is a digitally enabled individual who is using technology to engage in society, to engage with government, to engage in policy making. That's truly the definition. And uh, one of the engagement topics that uh, today is very relevant to our societies and economies is how should we think about the evolution of AI and what ethic frameworks we want to put around it. But probably I'm running ahead of my skis here, so I would limit the definition again to using technology to engage in government, with governments, in policies, and within societies and economies. Absolutely. And how do you think, uh, Mr. Endrick, how do you think we've, we've advanced specially to define a digital citizen in the era of AI, spe of AI specifically? Well, <coughs> I'd say for me, of 
course, the, what was mentioned before, but for me, in order to be maybe a digital citizen, sometimes you might not even realize it because all of it is happening in the back end, so to say. It's become and second nature to us. Yeah, I, I would say so. For, from my own, pre pre let's say, personal experience, when we look at Estonia, then people don't really think about it like they are digital citizens. They're just citizens, but digital is our way. We're not doing things, you know, uh, we're not doing different things in Estonia. We're just doing things a bit differently. Yeah. And, and uh, what we're like, let's say, moving towards right now is, is that the government as such um, will become more and more seamless. You don't even realize that it's there. Um, if you need something, the government proactively does it for you. And mm. in that case, of course, there's a lot of data analytics happening. And the AI would be supportive of that. Of course, there's some let's say, instances where this is happening already, but in a large scale, I think in the next five, ten years are going to be fundamentally, you know, crucial for that. Crucial for us. Uh, I will talk more about what Estonia is doing in this regard, but I want to start with a local example. As I said earlier, at Ajman X Shekhanoda, you guys are trying, from my understanding, to uh, advance the way a, d a citizen interacts with government by moving maybe uh, government services to become heavily reliant on artificial intelligence. Can you tell us a little about this and how does that uh, benefit the citizen and the government at the same time? Uh, uh, لأن موضوع جدا مهم وأعتقد أن في ناس كثيرة تسأل يعني شو الفرق ما بين المواطن العادي والمواطن الرقمي هو المواطن العادي أو المواطن الرقمي هو مواطن في النهاية عنده حقوق وواجبات ومسؤوليات والحكومة توفر له خدمات وهو بعد يقدم خدمات المجتمع فمن هنا يعني أنا بسأل سؤال متى المواطن يعتبر نفسه أنه تحول لمواطن رقمي تذكرون بس نرجع لسنوات قبل أول مرة سجلت فيها بريد إلكتروني هذا الأول مرة هاي اللي سجلت فيها بريد إلكتروني تحول المواطن إلى مواطن رقمي من مواطن عادي لمواطن رقمي باختصار تعريف المواطن الرقمي أو من وجهة نظري أنا الشخصية أنه هو عبارة عن مواطن تم تهيئة البيئة المحيطة فيه بتكنولوجيا بأمور تقنية ساعدت وساهمت على أنه يستخدمها تجربة عجمان إكس اجت من سياسة أو توجه دولة الإمارات إلى اقتصاد أو أحد محاورها هو اقتصاد المعرفة فكثير من المؤسسات بدت تنشأ وتضع مشاريع ومبادرات على مستوى دولة الإمارات لدعم موضوع اقتصاد المعرفة واستشراف المستقبل فمن هنا توجيهات من الشيخ راشد بن حميد النعيمي رئيس دارة التخطيط ودعمة تم إنشاء واستحداث مركز عجمان إكس اللي نركز فيه أو الهدف الأساسي له اللي هو تحقيق مستقبل الإمارة تحقيق الآن ما نتريا أن المستقبل هو يوصلنا لا إحنا اللي نسعى له فركزنا فيها على ثلاث محا ثلاث ركائز أساسية اللي هو المواطن والحكومة ال entity government والقطاع الخاص اللي هم شركات التكنولوجيا ف فهذا هذا دور عجمان إكس المواطن أو ال ال digital citizen عشان إحنا نهيئهم لاستخدام التقنيات الحد الحديثة والتكنولوجيا حطينا برامج ومبادرات ومشاريع نرفع فيها من مستوى الوعي اللي موجود في هذا المجال صحيح. الحكومة أو الدوائر الحكومية تبنينا برامج أو وضعنا برامج ومشاريع على أساس trying to push them toward the future أو أنهم يتبنون مشاريع مستقبلية 
يقدروا يخدموا يمكن المواطن يخدموا المواطن ويقدموا خدمات لهم فظهرنا بمبادره اللي هي ذا فيوتشر سيريس وكانت مخرجاتها 32 مشروع مشروع مش مبادرات عاديه مشاريع مستقبليه تنفذ تنفذ وان شاء الله ما نشوف نتائجها على ارض الواقع خلال الاسابيع الجايه ان شاء الله ان شاء الله اوكي القطاع الثالث اللي هم قطاع تكنولوجيا المعلومات او القطاع الخاص من شركات تكنولوجيا المعلومات وايد مهم ان احنا نشوف الشركات اللي تقدم سواء خارج الدوله او من داخلها وخصوصا في عندنا شركات عالمية وشركات ناشئة تقدم حلول ممكن تفيد دولة الإمارات أو تفيد إمارة عيمان يحضرني مثال لي في شركة من الشركات إحنا طلعنا على تجربتهم وهاي التجربة مطبقينها في السويد اللي هو موضوع السيارة ذاتية القيادة للمستودعات لأن, المستو... لأن في دولة السويد قطاع النقل عندهم شوي رواتب السائقين غالية فحطوا دمجوا الذكاء الاصطناعي مع سيارة ذاتية النقل و... ويو طبقوها فشافوا أثر ال... ال... التكنولوجيا بعد ما طبقوها في سيارة ذاتية القيادة على الاقتصاد مالهم مقابل ان كيف استفادت منها فهذا المثال احنا ما نقدر نطبقه عندنا لكن لان احنا رواتب السائقين قليلة جدا مش بحاجة مش بحاجة فمن هنا يدور ان احنا نطرح الحلول على الدوائر الحكومية ونشوف شو ال الحل المناسب لنا ويتبنونه للسيتيزن فبالتالي شيء احنا دمجنا ما بين القطاع الخاص وخلينا الدوائر الحكوميه تتبنى التقنيات الحديثه بالاضافه الى ان المستفيد هو المواطن او المقيم في دوله الامارات اكيد ومش غلط الواحد يطلع على افضل الطرق يعني من حول العالم و to localize يعني اللي المهم um, moving on from uh, Sheikh Anwar after having had this this uh, very interesting and, and inspiring example locally I want to move to E Estonia I will definitely uh, give you uh, the floor to explain to us about E Estonia uh, in in brief but I would like to focus on how this is fundamentally changing. Um, I mean, maybe people in Estonia are not realizing how, how digital is impacting their lives, but maybe if you, we can zoom out a little bit and look at how is this disrupting the very basic notion of the state and the interaction between a citizen and the state, and what's the impact of that? Yeah, well, I'll start actually with, with maybe the reasoning behind, like why, even why did we go digital? Especially in a situation where today, I don't think there's a country where there are elections and then, then the candidates don't talk about, let's say, uh, digitalization. And, and quite often they bring Estonia as an example, which is you know, free publicity for us. Great. Uh, <laughs> yeah, great. But, but in reality, why did we do that so much earlier? Let's say, why did we start two decades ago? The situation was the following. Uh, very limited human and financial resources. Uh, yet the government that wanted to be able to provide services to everybody. But the situation is that we had 1.3 million people and let's say 45,000 square kilometers, which in perspective put is uh, Estonia is bigger than Switzerland, bigger than Belgium, bigger than Denmark, bigger than Netherlands, and so on. So how can we as a state provide services to everybody when the density of population is so low? And, and building government office in, a, in the middle of the forest, in our case, or let's say in the middle of the desert, doesn't seem like a sustainable idea. Mm. So we figured maybe there's an alternative way how we can efficiently provide services to people uh, without the need to build these physical offices. Infrastructure. And in, exactly. And the understanding was that, well, if we do it digitally over the internet and we make sure that the internet is everywhere in our country, then essentially every device that can be connected to the internet has some sort of a user interface can become a government office, you know. My phone it's more efficient. Is, it, well, definitely yeah. for the government. Uh, digital services are cheaper for the government, therefore 
we think that they should be cheaper for the end user as well. So actually the end user wins as well in that mm -hmm. case. And, and now in a, we are in a situation where 99% of all government services are accessible regardless of the time, location, or device. So, you know, 4 a.m. on a Saturday morning in the middle of the forest on a mobile phone. Uh, and, and people maybe don't realize this, but this affects everything. This affects the government. This affects the GDP of the government. This, this affects the, their living standard. So let me just clarify one thing. Uh, the, the, the digital here is not just a communication tool between me as a citizen and some, um, you know, some employee yeah. at the other end of, mm -hmm. of the screen, basically. Yeah. I, I can just have my entire, s I will be completely serviced digitally. Uh, yeah, I should have maybe clarified this as well. Yeah, digital doesn't mean that you send an email and then hope something happens. No, no, happens. absolutely. It's, it is, but even if it it's a process, usually there's a human being that has to like approve at the end, let's say. Yeah, uh, in our case, if I'm not mistaken, I think 95% of the communication, well, when we talk about providing a service, is machine to machine already, okay. computer to computer. And 5% of the interactions uh, actually need a, let's say, government yeah. official to, let's say, accept something, uh, verify something, you know, just because of we have some restrictions or limitations of certain, certain areas. Uh, but yeah, when we talk about digital, then it's really happening, as I said, in the back end, uh, automated uh, and, and seamlessly, so that the person or even the government doesn't feel like it's happening. And, and that is, that is you know, the reality, what we, what we have and what we see. And also what was uh, mentioned before um, is that there are different aspects that are you know, important to focus on. And, and, and two of them also I want to point out is, is definite education, right? Mm. Uh, teaching people what a computer looks like. <laughs> In the late 90s, this was important. Today, of course, everybody has a you know, smart smart uh, or let's say supercomputer in 90 standards in their pocket but today cyber awareness cyber security cyber literacy these topics are important and then on the other side um, mm, public private partnership also what was mentioned before mm. without this uh, we would not be where we are today uh, without uh, let's say the government that has been the initiator of change and then the private sector that actually has executed it in our case, our digital society, as you said, it, it hasn't been built by the government. It be, has been initiated by the government. It's been built by our private sector companies, um, some of which are not you know, local, but they are, they are regional, they are global. Mm. Uh, they're also in this area. For example, I know Nortal, uh, an Estonian company is here, and they're collaborating with this government as well. Uh, why? That is also a question. Of course, you have competences here as well, but what we like to say in Estonia is that you know, not only have we built a digital society, we still remember how it is done. Yes. So uh, maybe we will not build it for you, that's not what we will do, but we can give some input on what are the mistakes that we made and how to avoid them, totally. how to make this transfer even more you know, smoother, because that is the right. challenge, I guess. Also, the question is, is how to switch over from one to another one without uh, you know, losing too much out in, in, in between. We will talk about that, actually, about this, this uh, um, turning point uh, that we face, uh, but you have touched on a couple of challenges. Mm -hmm. I want to expand on the challenges that, uh, I mean, one of the biggest topics we, we, uh, we hear about when we talk about the future is the automation of jobs, right? So this is one thing, so the impact on, on labor. Um, Dr. Karim, you come across, or you can maybe forecast the challenges that we we will have to face eventually and overcome. What are the main challenges here uh, that you can identify? So we job won't ask you for the solutions just yet. <laughs> You're absolutely right in terms of, I, I think the, where we're going to feel this the most in terms of cognitive capabilities being deployed on top of the digital footprints that exist today is that some of the jobs are going to be replaced, uh, will be automated and uh, you know, there are two types of forecasters, those who know that they don't know and those who uh, sort of think they know but actually they don't know. So I'm not going to give you a forecast with scientific um, sort of precision. What I would say is I think it's reasonable to assume that 50% of the work that we conduct today in our daily lives as professionals in whatever field will be automated between now and 2030. Uh, and I think it's also reasonable to assume that 
anywhere between 15 and 30 percent of the jobs that exist today will be displaced, i.e. they would not exist anymore the way they exist. And probably 3% to 5% of the job that exists today would not have a role in the future. Now, it sounds a bit bleak as an outlook, but I would like to remind everyone that um, in the course of human history, every time a new technology was introduced and a single job was lost, around 2.5 new jobs were created. That's the empirical evidence. That's the positive note. And many of us are a living example of this. Uh, my father was an industrialist. I worked in the digital media and the mobile telecom industry, so something that my generation didn't know. Then I worked in the space industry. Today I work in the cybersecurity industry. One of my son is a game designer. He is in an industry that didn't exist at the time when I came to the job market. And another son is studying data science again, an industry that didn't exist when I went to college. So the point that I want to make is um, it is a challenge, but the history of, human, um, uh, of our human experience has been that with every dislocation, a new sort of disruption and transformation on the positive side will come in. But I would concede we don't have all the answers today. That's Absolutely. for sure. I mean, and just to, uh, we had this conversation slightly, and I did argue saying, yes, you end up with two jobs, but these are two new jobs with That's right. that require different skill sets. So there is in inevitably a, a part of society that might be, you know, it's too late for them to switch careers, or um, th they'll be marginalized somehow. Th um, it, it is true. It is true. And um, uh, th that doesn't labor. just apply to the cognitive era in which we are entering. It has applied to the other eras. And uh, building on our earlier conversation, there will be probably new social nets, social security nets that would have to be created in our societies and economies to cater for this. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in, in some time, but I want to lay out the challenges first. Uh, so there is a challenge on the labor, the labor market itself. Um, but uh, Inek, you also discussed uh, a challenge that is posed on the state. So maybe um, even Sheikh Anura can talk about, you know, what are the, you're, you, you have a long way ahead of you. So what are some of the challenges that you might uh, face from a governance side? Um. أنا أيد على كلام دكتور عبد الكريم في موضوع أن في تحديات إحنا منواجهها لإنشاء واستحداث وظائف في المستقبل في أسئلة ممكن إحنا نطرحها اليوم عندنا مواضيع سيارات ذاتية القيادة زين هاي سيارات ذاتية القيادة إذا عطلت أمنو اللي بيصلحها هل اللي بيصلحها كهربائي ولا بروجرامر فهاي الأسئلة مثال ثاني طلعنا على مبادرة مبادرات في دول أنهم عشان يزيدون مثلا الذاكرة أو يخزنون معلومات إضافية في أدمغة الإنسان ففي تشيبس يزرعونها في أدمغة الإنسان صح هاي التشيبس إذا عطلت من اللي بيصلحها هل طبيب جراح ولا بروجرامر فمن هنا يعني كيف احنا بنعالج هاي التحديات او بنحط لها قوانين او تشريعات او مناهج تدرس في الجامعات على اساس ان يكون في عندنا ناس متخصصين ممكن يكون عندنا طبيب تقني مثلا دامج ما بين المهنتين ف... فهذا تشالنج بينا ريسن يعني قريبا هذا تشالنج للغورمنت نفسها للغورمنت نفسها إدارات الموارد البشرية تبتدي تعدل في قوانينها في تشريعاتها في استحداث وظائف جديدة وتأهل الموظفين اللي موجودين لتغيير مسار شيء أكيد هذا ما بيستوي بسرعة بس بس نحط لهم برامج وخطط لتغيير مساراتهم هذه مثل ما قال دكتور كريم 
ان الوظيفه اللي بتلغي ممكن تظهر مكانها وظائف ثانيه على نفس المجال يعني انا ممكن الحين وظيفه ال ال الموظفين الكاونتر انزين او موظفين المسؤولين عن سيارات ذاتيه القياده بدل ما يكون عندي ميكانيكي بيكونون في غرفه التحكم صح فهنا بتتغير وظائفهم فهي كلها امور احنا محتاجين نراجعها نراجع اجراءات وقوانين نحط لها تشريعات قبل وبعدين نبتدي نحط برامج للموظفين نبتدي ناهل الناس اللي موجودين انهم يتقبلون التغيير هذا اكيد ف... اكيد Um, Sheikh Anura, you talk about, uh, uh, you mentioned a few technical issues, mm -hmm. but uh, with Enik, I want to talk about just the overarching governance because eventually, you know, the sum of all these little things, you end up having to create a structure of, of a, some blanket regulations or some uh, general uh, thematic regulations, and th there, are, there are so many uh, challenges in that regard. What are some of the stuff you faced at the Estonia? Yeah, I will also take the moment to, to make a comment about the, the, the challenge that you mentioned before, actually about the learning and relearning, and, and some people maybe are at a certain age where relearning is not as easy, but I think the reality of the situation is that, that the world is changing so fast, first of all, and, and um, and today, you know, in the 21st century, w we are preparing literally our people to the 22nd century, to be honest, because uh, the people that are going to live in the 22nd century are or already amongst us. They're already living, you know, uh, children. But in the, the, let's say, illiteracy in the 21st century now is not being able to read or write. That is old history. Today, illiteracy is not being able to learn new things, you know, relearn, uh, change your, let's say, career path. Pivot and change exactly. based on what's and, needed. And lifelong learning. I mean, that was mentioned in the previous panel. I'm pretty sure it's been mentioned also all during this, this uh, summit here is that lifelong learning is something that is the reality. Mm -hmm. um, but now also to touch upon the technical and, and the overarching and the regula regulatory challenges. For example, in Estonia, we've realized that, um, uh, you know, we also have, you know, driverless vehicles uh, coming to Estonia now. And, and, and there are places where these need to be tested and, and Estonia, why not in Estonia? And, and now the question is, should we regulate driverless vehicles? Well, some people might say, yes, of course. We would say, no, that's too specific. We should have an overarching regulation about AI. We should have, you know, regulation about maybe algorithms. We should have regulation that is irrespective of the field that deal with uh, privacy, liability, mm. um, you know, ethics. ethics morality, these type of things. And, and then of course, like if, if this, not only the question is, is if, if uh, self-driving or driverless vehicle malfunctions, who's gonna fix it, but who's also reliable, you know, and, and how much the government should, you know, control certain aspects, because there's always this balance now. If the government says that they have to check every algorithm before it can be implemented, then uh, that will hinder innovation. That cannot happen. But then again, how can the government allow algorithms that will decide upon human lives if they don't know what's in it? So is open source the solution? Is, is the fact that there will be international experts that can always verify that this algorithm actually does what it's supposed to do? And, and so on, that is the question. That is something that we're dealing in today, dealing with today, sorry. And, and, and we want to you know, kind of come up with a white paper or a, or a legal framework by May next year that should, you know, address these, these challenges for us as, as a state and then, you know, go from there. And maybe this is something that other nations can also learn from. Uh, you're, you're already trying to give them help on, you know, the example that you've lived and, and how they can learn from it. Um, we've covered uh, the impact on, on labor, we've covered uh, the challenges uh, faced in terms of governance and regulation, but what about the impact that such changes bring to the fabric of society? Uh, when I have, uh, and I'm gonna really simplify this for everybody, when I have a machine that learns all about me to give me what I want, I end up getting a lot of what I want and nothing what I should know about. Um, 
the, the idea of, of echo chambers, Dr. Karim had mentioned this uh, earlier inside to me. This is something that, do you, do you see such an impact already happening in society? So we see this impact in, um, in, in societies across, across the world, i.e., I have an inclination to read a certain type of news, to, s to watch a certain type of content. The machine learns about these things and proactively pushes the same things to me, the same themes. And all it does, it reinforces my biases. And what we end up with is societies that are moving more and more towards the extremes. And that's going to be a very difficult and challenging problem to deal with because to go back to what Endrick said is, we're not going to solve this by regulating the algorithm. That doesn't happen. Regulation cannot try to take control of technologies. And let me give you a practical example. If the Wright brothers at the start of the 20th century had to sort of meet the civil aviation requirements of the country in which they were operating to make their first flight, there would have never been a first flight. So technology is always going to be ahead of regulation. Now, at some point in time, the two are going to intersect. But to go back to the essential question of how do you mitigate the echo chamber phenomenon, i.e., I think something and I, the chamber sort of echoes the same thing to me, it will go down to what was discussed already by Sheikh Hanoura and, and by Hendrik and by yourself, which is we go back to the education system. In our schools and in our universities, it's important that there is a part of the education system that deals with liberal arts, where our children are exposed to all the type of philosophies and influences. Me and that the can, other. And me and others that mm -hmm. will help them become more informed citizens. And from there, they'll be better equipped to make good decisions going forward. So I can spend a lot of time on this, but for me, it boils down to how they will be brought up through the education brought system. Up. Yeah. So as much as we're putting emphasis on STEM related, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and what have you, which are going to be essential to our fields, and yes. my company is made of PhDs and, and very brilliant engineers, liberal art has to be also at the center of our education system. And I think this was lost somewhere. Um, I was having a conversation a couple of weeks ago, and I don't know, maybe everyone can agree or disagree. Back in the day, there were fewer maybe uh, media, mainstream media outlets available for us. People used to, maybe a country would have one or two or three newspapers, but then every household would be subscribed to all three points of view, right? So everyone would have a, a more 360 view on what's happening with the world. Now, if I don't like your page, I'm not subscribing. This is, this is the, something got lost. Now we have more access, but we want to know less. We want to be more tailored in a sense. Um, and of course, these are few of the many challenges, I believe. I don't want to turn this into a um, concerning session, so I will move on from the challenges which will continue with us in our conversation. But I want to talk about the driver of growth. Now, in previous uh, revolutions or industrial revolutions, steam, electricity, computers, the internet were the main driver of growth. Um, of course, consecutively, what would be the main driver of growth in a knowledge-based society in the era of AI for the future? I think um, for me, that is, I think everybody thinks about the same thing. I'm not sure, but I think it, it will have to be data. Data. And data analysis and predictive analytics and, and providing the, um, you know, the insight that has been maybe lacking before, sometimes maybe before processes happen because um, either they've always had happened before like this or, or you know, the, there was not real, really understand the, uh, real understanding why it happened. But mm. now you can actually, you know, understand why that's the way it went or that's the way it's going to go in whatever process we're talking about. Yes. Why some places people prefer this fruit and then other places that we're fruit, able to example. understand patterns we're able to yeah and 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 the sectors where i feel that this is going to happen the most is is something that everybody can relate to and one topic that i think everybody one sector that everybody can relate to is health personal health and 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 that will be something where innovation will you know thrive and and data will thrive and that is 
quite interesting. Also something that we are thinking as a state that we should deal more with data and, and now it's drifting away a bit, but still when we link it to data, then the situation we are as a state right now, we are not satisfied. We are dealing with diseases. We're dealing with ill people. We yes. don't want to do that. We want to deal with you know, preventive actions so that they, we wouldn't have diseases or, or illnesses. And I think data is the solution. You know. It's Put already it started being used in, in many industries, yeah, I including mean, we, health. We are gathering, for example, genome, uh, genotype information voluntarily, of course, on adult population. And we have enough to make uh, statistical analysis. But that's just one side. That is theoretical statistical analysis. What we really want to do, we want to take this and put it together with real life data. So yeah. we predict that you might have that disease at that age, at that uh, area or region, at that gender, you know. But How is it, is it true? It? So if we put those together, we'll get even more information now. And I think that will, that will essentially will hap be happening in a any or every field of, mm. of uh, our sector. Sheikh mm. do you agree that data is the main driver of growth? In, in the era of AI? And if it's say yes, then I have a follow-up question for you. Yeah, <laughs> فمن أهلا يمكن السنة اللي طافت كان في قمة المعرفة كانوا يابين صوفيا وخبرونا عنها إن هي كانت طفلة عمرها ثمان سنين يعني فخذت معلوماتها من الإنترنت من مقابلة الناس من من أكثر عن مصدر تعلمت تعلمت ف فالبيانات وايد مهمة بس الأهم منها أن أنا أستفيد منها على أساس أشوف أنا وين ممكن أطور يساعد المؤسسات أو الدولة في تحديد توجهات معينة الذكاء الصناعي أكيد وصلنا المرحلة أن they will take a decision يعني في مثال لشري أو في شركة من الشركات العالمية اللي هي ت تنتج ال ال البروسيسور والماذر بوردز أنتل غيرت استراتيجيتها في ال أو إن وجهت استراتيجيتها بأنها تعتمد على الداتا من ضمن الكلام يعني اللي كانوا طارحينه إن تخيلوا إن سيارات ذاتية القيادة وأنا وايد أتكلم عن سيارات ذاتية القيادة في يوم واحد جمعوا منها حوالي أربعة تيرابايت داتا بيانات, بيانات. فتخيلوا أنتوا حجم البيانات اللي إحنا ممكن نحصل عليه من من الانفراستراكتشر اللي موجود من قواعد البيانات اللي موجودة من الخدمات الذكية أو الخدمات الإلكترونية استخدامات الناس فهاي بتساعد كثير في بشكل إيجابي أكيد في زيادة الإنتاجية في اتخاذ قرارات ندعم فيها اقتصاد الدولة فأكيد البيانات مهمة طيب لكن هنا في تحديات أين تجدي مثلا نحن منح منح يعني وين صرنا in terms of مثلا data gathering data analysis هل متطورين هل لسه بدنا بعد لقدام نشتغل what are the main challenges here هي تجميع البيانات كلها في مكان واحد يعني الانتجريتي وايد مهم ما ما تكون البيانات معزولة عن بعض إحنا وصلنا يعني يمكن بداية الثورة الصناعية الرابعة حينا فإحنا في البداية في مؤسسات أكيد وصلوا إنهم يظهرون معلومات معينة أو إن يكونون مثلاً إحنا عندنا في إمارة عيمان تطبيق تصديق تطبيق تصديق يا نظم موضوع الإيجارات اللي في الإمارة كانت في فترة من الفترات توصلنا شكاوي إن المؤجر هذا زاد الإيجار في البناية الفلانية وهذا لا في تفاوت في الإيجارات فلما طبقنا فلما تم تطبيق النظام هذا ساهم كثير في موضوع إن المؤجر لما يغير في 
السعر لشقه معينه مثلا المالك. تكلفتها 50 هي المالك المؤجر هي 50 الف مثلا في حين ان في منطقه ثانيه نفس البنايه بنفس المواصفات لكن سعرها اقل فهنا بي دور البيانات اللي موجوده بتقول لنا لا تعطيك فلاج فلاج ان يو كانوت ريز ذا ذا رنت فهذا تطبيق للانتجريتي اللي اعطانا قرار في ان لا في هالمناطق ذس از ذا رنت يعني ما اقدر انا ازيد في النهايه انا يهمني السيتيزن اللي موجودين يهمني ان الناس تكون سعيده عايشه مرتاحه فهذا هذا التطبيق اللي انا اقدر اقول اتكلم عنه يعني واللي شفته انترستنج دكتور كريم وات دو يو ثينك ان تيرمز اوف داتا جاذرينج داتا اناليسيز ار وي بيهايند ار وي ديفلوبد وات ار ذا مين تشالنجز وي ار فيسينج ام اي ثينك وي ار ان ذا ايرلي انينجز ذس از وات اي وود ساي اي ثينك سم اندستريز ار مور ادفانسد ذان اذرز Uh, I'll give you another industry where there is today probably most of the progress and where we're going to see the whole AI transforming an industry and it's going to be in the field of autonomous driving and autonomous mobility. If you think about today's mobility, so I buy a car and I use the car, I use, I use the car around 5% of the time and 95% of, of the time this car doesn't do anything. And so the cost of driving a mile during the lifetime of the car, let's say, is X. In an era of autonomous driving, that cost will be one-tenth. This is the difference in the economics. And the industry of mobility as a service that is enabled by data and enabled by cognitive system that can sell drives is 10 times the size of today's traditional car industry. Now, I'm giving this example for three reasons. One, to underscore that in some industries, we're making more advances in terms of cognitive capability and accumulating the data sets than others. Two, is to underscore that there is going to be dislocation of traditional industries and in industries that do not exist today. So mobility as a service does not exist. In the future, we don't need to own a car. We just have to ask for a service to move from point A to point B. And three is to say that in this transformation, there will be much more value created than value that is distort, dis destroyed. Okay. The same conversation that we had on the jobs. Um, and in a sense, in our day-to-day -day life as citizens, we're already contributing to this. So if you drive a car today that has a self-driving or an autopilot capability, the sheer fact that you're driving the car, this car has cognitive capability, you are teaching the artificial intelligence engine in your car. You are, in fact, training the machine. You may not realize this, and I go back to what Hendrik said in the beginning. AI is not going to be visible anymore. And in our daily seamless. behavior, it's seamless. We are training the engine. We're training this agent that is going to improve our experience to us. So I go back to your question. I think we're in the early innings of accumulating data. The data sets have to be clean. Uh, have to be accessible, and I'm a very strong proponent of making them available on a platform where uh, private operators, uh, whether national or international, can sort of tap into this and sort of come up with new solutions. And um, again, where I see this probably moving the fastest is going to be in autonomous driving, certainly. Okay. Now, in our field in cybersecurity, we're already quite advanced on this. Uh, but cybersecurity is for another panel, and plus probably I will create more anxiety than anything else if I open that topic. Uh, all I can tell you is in the cybersecurity field, the, the data sets and the cognitive capability that we bring together is helping us keep, keep the nation safe, keep the, keep the main organizations very safe. But again, it's, a, it's an evolutionary process. So we should not at any given point in time think that we're now on top of sort of controlling the data, and we're there. Uh, unlike any other industry, this probably is going to be a constant evolution going forward. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, the experience from Estonia is, is a case in point. You've been at this for more than two decades, and, uh, and I, I would say you're still early days. Yeah, and in addition, like, we never in the beginning had a strategy, let's say, like, you know, in 2000, that by 2020, we're going to be here, or 10 to 2020, we're going to be here. We evolved with the world and the circumstances changing, and this is also happening. 
Um, like, I don't think the world is ready in that sense, uh, or finished, let's pu put it this way, and it will still keep evolving and changing, and now it's upon the states and private, let's say, stakeholders to Catch adapt up. to the Catch changes, yeah. and, and this it will be continuous. Uh, what, what I know is that uh, every two years, they say the process, the processing time of analyzing data doubles. That's right. Is this going in hand with how quickly or the amount of data that's coming in that's being poured in to be analyzed? Do we have more supply in data than ability to process at this stage? I'm pretty sure they're gonna, there's going to be a scary exponential growth of because you know, it's usually the data. early adopters and then it spikes. There's a tipping point, usage spike, spikes in any technology, right? So, so maybe, uh, have you had that over the past? I mean, for eEstonia, did you in, in maybe two, three years have a sudden spike in the number of uh, e-citizens, uh, let's say? That well, mm, kind of, not, not in that sense, but I think it was 2007-ish, seven, eight, nine. Okay. During the financial crisis of the world, we also reflected a bit what needs to be done. And during that period, we can say that the e-state really kicked in. Before okay. that, you know, it was, was kind of, but, but then, then it really kicked in. I mean, the, the let's say, the uh, regis registry of databases, I think in these couple of years, it doubled. So there were so many more government institutions that now were able to exchange data uh, in yeah. this distributed network that we have. And and we are expecting also, yeah, you mentioned e-citizenship, e so we are, let's say, e-citizens, but everybody of the world can become an e-resident of Estonia, right? And today we're around 50,000, I think, but we're also presuming that there's going to be an exponential growth. And the question now probably that you're trying to ask or, or you we're intending to ask is, what are we going to do if that overnight we get like 10 million? Is our infrastructure going to be able to handle it? And, and I think today, the system actually, I think the statement can be made that uh, even if every person on earth, which is highly unlikely, so mm -hmm. seven plus billion people would become near residents of Estonia, we would be able to handle it because the digital world, it is scalable. And, yes. and, and the scalability, sometimes it's hard to comprehend by a human mind, but uh, also Absolutely. in the age of cloud computing, I don't see as scalability mm -hmm. will be an issue, but mm -hmm. of course, but I think you'd need sort of a, it would be a crash time of get all the talents that we need, get, I mean, even human resources as oh, well. Well, that, that will be probably a struggle for us, and, and as we, I think we've discussed before as well, uh, is, is the question of uh, attracting these talents, and, and, um, and yeah, and, and countries are going to compete for them. Okay. Um, would you like to add anything? Yeah, look, I, I would like to put the, your question in the context of the UAE and a recent initiative. So back at JITEX, uh, the TRA, the government of Abu Dhabi and Dubai announced the launch of the UAE Pass. And Dark Matter was fortunate to have worked uh, with, with these uh, uh, organizations on this. And in fact, it's a digital identity that can be used by any citizen or resident to transact both with government agency as well as with the private sector. And so to go back to your question, are we going to face an era of an explosion of data? The answer is yes, because this UAE pass, in fact, is a pass for me to re really go about my daily life and, and uh, undergoing and performing all of these activities in a very seamless manner, whether it's completing what I wanted to complete, register a car, buy a home, uh, pay a fine, etc., settle my bank account, whatever it is, uh, and then the data then of my behavior, of my habits, of my preferences, of the choke points I experience in my daily life would be used to improve these services in the future. Mm -hmm. Now the good news is we're not going to choke on this because AI is exactly here to do so. Machine learning will uh, enable systems to aggregate, to analyze, to interpret, and even to recommend actions based on these data sets. So okay, in a I'm sense, just... it's a positive self-reinforcement uh, mm -hmm. and not a negative self-reinforcement that Good. we're going to experience. Good. And again, I was keen to put this in the context of the UAE. Yes, yes absolutely. Well, that, that's, that's good news at the end of the day. Um, we did, I want to touch uh, base back on the, the, uh, the idea of this sudden tipping point that we usually see in every change in society, in technology, etc. Dr. Karim spoke about um, um, 
Well, w what I'm referring to is, is in fact the angels pause. So, so you, you back in, in the industrial revolution, you had things got worse for about 50 years before they started getting better, right? So this is, this is what usually happens when we have a sudden change in, in regular operation, basically. Uh, how can we best, uh, do, do we have an angel's pause right now? Or are we approaching one? And how can we make this as smoothest transition as possible? So the, when this pause was measured back at the start of the Industrial Revolution, if my memory serves me well, uh, this was a time also when social security nets were created. Yes, you So in a sense, that, yeah. uh, there was a lot of tensions and pressures in these societies and economies, but at the same time, this is when the government took conscious of the fact that they needed to provide these nets. Uh, and I think going forward, we need to think about future-proof social security nets that would accompany these transformation. And in our earlier uh, conversation where we we're preparing this panel, you rightly referenced the, uh, the concept of the minimum basic income, which is a concept that now is being considered by a number of countries. I don't think the model is mature enough, but that will be one of the ways where when there is job, this, when there is dislocation of the job market, yes. you sort of create new social security nets that will be able to absorb uh, some of the initial waves until you have the new generation of workers with the right skills, the right skills to come in and sort of smoothen this passage. So I don't, I don't, we don't have the answer whether we're going to experience the same pause or not. I think we have a responsibility as policymakers, captains of industries, uh, leaders of uh, cities and nations mm. to think about these future-proof social security nets. It's absolutely Just necessary. Just so we're proactive and not reactive yeah. to when, when this happens. Um, having said that, so we, we do have talent. It's not like we are lacking talent entirely, but there are a lot of countries that are already reporting um, a mismatch between the talent that's available and the skills that are demanded in the market. And this is a lot of the times due to skilled immigration, right? So, so what is the impact? And, and I mean, of course, some places are better prepared, they are more attractive, etc., to these talents that have the required skills of today, and they would obviously go and, and practice there. Uh, how does that impact the knowledge economy? Does it create an imbalance of some kind? Maybe uh, Sheikh Anoura can talk about that. Uh. فيما يتعلق بموضوع هجرة العقول الدولة تبنت موضوع استحداث تخصصات جديدة في في الجامعات والمدارس يعني صارت الحين المناهج مثلا فيها مواضيع البروجرامينج الروبوتس الذكاء الاصطناعي وغيره نفس الشيء في تخصصات جديدة استحدثت في الجامعات تخدم مواضيع العلوم المتقدمة أه بس في جانب ثاني أه اللي هو توفير سوق العمل اللي بيدعم التخصصات هذه أه يعني بصراحة يعني اليوم بتلاقي بتلاقي معظم المشاريع كلها متجهة نحو أه كافي شوب إنزين أه بس وين المشاريع اللي بتخلق سوق جديد في الإمارة في في الدولة وبتدعم التخصصات اللي احنا ياسين نأهل فيها شيء اكيد واحد بيدرس ذكاء اصطناعي في مجال معين او علوم الفضاء وما حصل السوق اللي يتبناه او التكنولوجيا او الشركات او المؤسسات اللي في تتبناه في مسماتش يعني هي فبتلاقينهم شيء طبيعي بي بيظهر برا ال فاحنا نخلق لهم السوق اللي مجرد انهم يتخرجون يكون عندهم مشاريع ناشئه نوفر لهم التسهيلات اللازمه نوفر لهم الدعم الكافي لانهم يبتدون مشاريعهم هذه البيئه الجاذبه لحتى البيئه الجاذبه لحتى انهم يتمون فهذه يعني هذه هذه ملاحظتي عليها دكتور كريم وات واتس يور اوبينيون اون ذا ماتر دو وي هاف امبالانس اور از ذس جاست نورمال اي ثينك اتس بارت اوف ذا ايب اند فلو اوف اوف ذا ليبر ماركت سو these imbalances are there, so I don't think we should deny that. Um, I think the fact that we have, um, we can leverage immigration of, of qualified labor as a, as a conduit to attract the right talents and put them in, in the industries where we have these rapid developments and we have a shortage of talent is a positive thing. But at the same time, I would say it's very important that every nation develops 
its own sovereign platform to develop its own nationals in these uh, industries of the future. And uh, the UAE specifically has, I think, the opportunity of benefiting from very young uh, and, uh, and progressive educational institutions where uh, I think the guardians of these institutions can, can look uh, and consider through a public discourse these, where the industries of the futures are, get, are heading and say, what is it that we need to change at the level of the school system? And what is it that we need to change at the level of the university system? And sort of put together the programs that will get there. And if I compare this to the, to the more advanced um, educational systems that have been there for centuries, they tend to be much more rigid. We look at them from the outside and we say they've been there for 100, 200 years, they have a tradition, uh, you know, they produce Nobel Prize and what have you, and you cannot deny this, that's a fact. But that very same fact makes them a bit more rigid to change and to evolve. Absolutely. And so I look again to the leaders of, of the UAE and say, you have a wonderful opportunity yes. to sort of craft them in a way that make them progressive and faster than anyone else. Absolutely. Um, I, before moving forward, I just want to have an idea about the time from, maybe they could just pull up the time for me on the screen, please, so we don't keep anyone behind. Um, now, usually all this talent and all these skills are being pulled into what we've uh, become to know as talent hubs, right? So, um, one of the biggest examples uh, is Silicon Valley. There's a lot of talent there that's, in relate, that's related to technology, you know, um, development, et cetera. You have uh, the more traditional talent hubs back in the day was maybe Hollywood, right? For, for arts and, and uh, film production, et cetera. Um, is this a good thing, having those talent hubs? Because that's where innovation comes from. That's where you usually have the universities, the research labs, et cetera. That's where innovation that would benefit the world comes from. But maybe is this, is this adding to the imbalance of talent that we're seeing around the world? And is urban planning um, something to be taken into consideration here? Inek, maybe you can... Uh, well, that is the question, I guess. Um, because you're talking about how it's meant to be seamless and across the board. And yeah, that's the... Th like, what I was thinking and, and seeing when we talk about talent and shortage of talent, then quite often most affected are smaller areas or smaller countries, like Estonia. Today, maybe the main shortage of skill, what we see is, is IT skills, IT-related skills. And in the next upcoming years, it's going to be thousands of people that we are missing, so to say. And yes, of course, education is vital. Uh, changing the university programs is vital, but that will have a delay, you know. If okay. Even if we change today, it will be a three-year, four, or let's say five-year course until we get these people. So we need to attract them somehow. Absolutely. And, and uh, then the next question is, do we really have to attract them? Or maybe they can be here just digitally. You know, when we talk mm -hmm. about digital nomads or people that are, you know, moving around the world and providing their expertise in several different locations, not like it used to be when you were in one place, let's say, uh, Hollywood you mentioned, but what if there are now the production is digital anyway, so what if they can give their insight globally over yes. Skype or whatever uh, solution? I thought you were going to talk about holograms or me, <laughs> you know, sending a version <laughs> of me somewhere. That would be interesting. That, that, well, that is anyway <laughs> possible already, but um, I'm, I'm thinking about the people that are in the, you know, behind the scenes and, and whose know-how is valued, but then again, the physical presence is not as needed as your physical presence would be Absolutely. needed as a presenter, okay. right? Or, or um, so, so, and, and how to attract these people um, and, and how to make their switching over from, you know, doing their work there to also no, not only there, but also for us can be as smooth as possible and mm. not having obstacles there. Okay. So that didn't really answer your question at all, but <laughs> it gave another perspective. It gave us insights on what yeah. the future could look like. Uh, I just want to wrap this up uh, by very briefly just asking about, I think we've already touched on the talents that are needed for the future in light of the importance of, of data and knowledge. We don't need factory workers anymore. Uh, that's definitely for sure. Um, having said all of this, how can we finally, just to wrap up, 
if you can give me your point of view on how can we stop becoming consumers of knowledge and start becoming producers of knowledge. Sheikh Anwira, maybe I will start with you. Um, um, ان احنا نبتدي نستفيد من الخبرات اللي موجودة بدل ما احنا نجلس نجمع بيانات ونركنها لا احنا نستفيد من الخبرات نأهل السيتيزن ان يكون مواطن رقمي نحط ضوابط وقوانين وتشريعات للتقنيات الجديدة مبادرات ومشاريع تدعم موضوع انتاج المعرفة لان المعرفة اليوم شيء مهم وهو سلاح السلاح المستقبل فبدون معرفة ما بيكون عندي ابتكار ما بيكون عندي ذكاء اصطناعي فبهالطريقة احنا بنكون وصلنا للمستقبل شكرا شيخ انا وراح دكتور كريم your thoughts in my mind is going to be the shift of paradigm from uh, pursuing knowledge as such to pursuing competences علم لكفاءة and the reason why I'm saying this uh, Knowledge today is accessible to us via the internet, and in a sense, it's numbing um, our situational awareness, in fact, as to what we know, we don't know the risk, the actions, the decisions we need to make. Competence is very different. Competence is about the explicit knowledge, but it's also about the experiences that we go through. So if I innovate, if I create, if I write a book, if I produce a painting, that's an experience. It's also a combination of our value judgment, so when we exercise our judgment to decide on something to take an action. And finally, it's a combination of the social network that we depend on to trade minds and ideas. And so it's perfectly within our remit, but I would say that it's important that we shift the perspective from I am knowledgeable to I am competent. Mm. And I think if you make that shift, you will be day in, day out, a producer of knowledge. Absolutely. And uh, finally, Mr. Enek. Yeah, I think that the key there is, is collaboration and utilizing the expertise that are global in, in certain areas. There are some things that are the best uh, you know, done here. There are some things that are the best done in the States, some yeah. things that are the best in Estonia or Latvia or, or Sweden. And there's no single place on earth that is the best in everything, right? Mm. So, but taking this know-how now and uh, uh, sharing this between each other and, and then also, you know, doing it cross-border on all different levels is, is the key to the, you know, not only being at the receiving end or, you know, consumption or, or but also not only being, let's say, data consumers, but also uh, providers and also yes. the producers, producers mm -hmm. and, and not only, let's say, limiting the entities that can produce data, but, you know, every can contribute some way. Absolutely. Uh, as an individual, I can contribute. As a government official, I can contribute. As a parent, I can contribute. As a car owner, I can contribute to. So open it up to everybody. Exactly. Open that. Uh, great. Thank you so much, uh, Sheikh Hanoura and Naimi, director of Ajman X, Dr. Karim Sabah, CEO of Dark Matter, and Mr. Endrick Onyx, speaker and exposition engagement at e Estonia. Before I wrap up, I just want to quickly run through, I mean, we've, we've run over time, uh, but do we have any Q&As from the audience? Okay, in that case, I think this is their way of telling me we've really run over time. I do invite uh, the audience to, uh, our, to address our panelists, uh, if that's okay, after, after we wrap up the session. Thank you very much uh, for sharing this with us today, and I wish you a very good evening. Thank you. Sure. Thank you.